notice if you come to First Baptist Church that often our services will have a theme running through the song service, the worship part of our service. And I doubt you can miss this morning the theme and the thought that God, that God can solve our problems. Did you catch that this morning? Through it all, even in the valley, God doesn't think like me. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to Matthew chapter 8 this morning. As a church family, we've been reading through the book of Matthew. In fact, if you've not uh, been able to, to get one of these rooted in the word books, has the book of Matthew split up into daily readings uh, with a place to enter in a journal, we'd be happy to put one in your hands today. There's no cost to you. I'm happy to put the word of God in your hand. If it helps you spend time with God, then this is a good thing. It's a good thing for people to spend time in the word of God. The word of God will help you. The word of God will grow you. And as a church family, we've been going through the, the gospel of Matthew, and I've been preaching some messages from Matthew. The first week we looked at Matthew, I asked the question, who's your king? And looking at the fact that Matthew in his book presents Jesus Christ as the king of kings and king of the Jews. And not only is king of the Jews, he ought to be king in your life and king in my life. All right? Jesus is the right king. Any other king is an unworthy and a bad king. Sometimes we want ourselves to be king of our life. And you and I know that, that if we're honest, when we're king of our life, we make a royal mess of things. Royal mess of things. Last week I asked the question, what's your story? We looked at Matthew and his call, the call of Matthew, the writer of the gospel of Matthew. He was a, he was a tax collector. Bible word they use is a publican. No one liked the publicans and yet Jesus knowing his background, knowing his place in life, called to Matthew. And Matthew didn't know where he was going. He didn't know all that it would entail. He didn't know where he'd end up. He just knew he had a choice to make, whether to follow Jesus or to reject Jesus. And I'm so glad that we know that Matthew followed Jesus. He left all and followed Jesus. He put down that tax collecting box. Those, uh, those few coins that he would have collected in God's economy are nothing. Because God paves his streets with gold. And he put that, slid that box aside, pushed that chair back from that table he was at, stood up and followed Jesus Christ. I have another question to ask you this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 8. But this question, before I ask you the question, and you need a little bit of context. You, you know, you understand that most communication in life is not what we say or verbal, but it's non-verbal. The way we say something, the, the way we look. You know that you can say the same thing two different ways and mean two different things. For instance, my wife is an excellent cook. I can tell her, honey, thanks a lot. Or I can say, honey, thanks a lot. I said the same thing, but I didn't say the same thing. You with me so far? I can say, hey, or I can say, hey. I'm saying the same thing, but it means two different things. And so the question this morning, you need to be careful with this question. Because how we ask it will provide us a wonderful answer. Here's the question this morning. What's your problem? Oh, this could go a lot of different directions, couldn't it, this morning? A lot of different directions. Them are fighting words in some scenarios, are they not? <laughs> Marriages destroyed, homes destroyed, basketball games destroyed, work environments, everything. This question right here could be a loaded question, the nonverbal. But this morning, I'm not asking what's your problem, but what's your problem? What is your problem? We all have problems in life. We all have difficulties. Your problem will maybe be similar to someone else's, but it'll still be different. Two people can lose a loved one. They can both lose a parent. And it can feel entirely different between the first person and the second person based on their relationship and, and what happened and how they lost their loved one. Two people can have financial crises and it can be two entirely different responses and feelings based on a situation and a scenario. 
Two people can have a problem at work with a coworker, and it can be completely different. Though our problems have some similarities, they are ultimately completely different between us because we are different people. And this morning, I want to tell you, I want to preach to you and, and remind you that Jesus Christ can and Jesus Christ desires to solve your problems. Matthew chapter 8 is a problem-solving chapter. From verse number 1 till verse, I think it's 34, the last verse of, of Matthew 8, we see Jesus Christ solving problems. Problem after problem after problem. Big problems, medium big problems, but everyone solved This morning, I want to direct our attention to the last problem that Jesus solved in Matthew chapter number 8. It's going to begin in verse number 28. Understand that right before this, Jesus was asleep in a boat. You remember that miracle? They went across the sea and a big storm comes up and the, 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 the disciples are scared out of their minds. Though they'd been on the ship many times, they'd been through countless storms, this storm was different. And the time they were scared, Jesus was asleep. And they were worried, they were concerned. And finally, they woke up Jesus and, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And don't you care about us? And, and Jesus stands up and rebukes the wind and rebukes the waves. He commands them to stop, and they stop. In verse 27, the Bible says the men marveled. That's the disciples who had been with Jesus. They marveled. They wondered. At, at, and they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? But look in verse 28. And when he was come into the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he, that is Jesus, said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Lord, I pray this morning as we look at your word that you would enlighten our eyes. Lord, we need you. Lord, I don't know all the problems that are represented here this morning, all the burdens that people are carrying. Lord, you know the burdens, you know the problems, and you and you alone have the power to meet these needs. Lord, I don't know what you want to do today, but I know that you want to do something and you want to work in hearts. And Lord, I pray that today you would do that, that we'd be good soil, that we'd listen to your truth and we'd respond to you. And Lord, I ask that what's done here would not just last today, but would have eternal effects, that decisions would be made for you today or that lives would be touched and changed. Lord, we love you. Lord, we need your help today. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. This particular account is found in a few of the other Gospels as well. It's a relatively familiar account, though there's some elements perhaps that Matthew brings out that you may, may or may not have been aware of. I think one of the key elements that is slightly different in Matthew's is the fact that Matthew mentions to us that there were two that came out possessed with devils that were exceeding fierce. The other accounts will focus just on one individual, but Matthew brings us the fact that there are two of these men there this day. Jesus lands on the shore and steps off the boat, and he's met by these two that are obviously demon-oppressed and demon-possessed. The Bible says that they were so fierce that no one could pass 
Or in essence, if you went here, you weren't going any further. You could not run around them, run through them. That They were stronger than the average man. And they had a place here, and they caused a large problem. I find that in our life, we often have large problems that we are faced with. In fact, I want us to remember this morning the first thought that often a problem is outside of our control. Can you imagine if you're not Jesus, and we're not, landing on this shore and seeing these two crazy, fierce individuals? We find out in other passages that that typically they wouldn't wear any clothes either. So you step off the boat, and two naked people come running at you. What are you doing? I'll tell you what Howell's doing, getting back on the boat. Can they swim? Hopefully not as fast as I can row. I'm getting out of here. Other pastors will tell us in, in Mark and in Luke that they would often bind them with chains. And they'd break the chains. And then can you imagine the first time that, that the, the citizens of this country used chains? Obviously, there's a problem there. They thought, boy, there's a problem with, these, with this man, these individuals who are obviously have some type of demon oppression and possession here. And so we'll take care of the problem. We'll put chains on them. This will fix it. Maybe they got together as a city council. Like, Listen, we need the strongest men here, the bravest men here. We're going to grab some chains. We're going to take care of the problem right here. Uh, we're going to take care of this problem. And man, the other town people, there's people in the city. Boy, this is good. This will solve the problem. Boy, I'm not going, but I'm glad you're going. Right? And these brave individuals these brave men and probably brave women, right, grabbing these chains, perhaps sneaking up on them and gaining the upper hand, binding with chains and cheering all the way back to town. Yeah, we did it. We did it. We did it. And hearing a strange sound like the breaking of chains. Whoops. You see, often problems are outside of my control. The problem is, I like trying to solve my problems, don't you? Don't you? We do like to solve, internally, we like to solve our problems. We have a problem at work, we try to think how to solve the problem. We have a problem at home, we try to think how to solve the problem. A problem with money, we try to think how to solve the problem. But often, our problems are outside of our control. Sometimes it's a doctor that calls, listen, your test results are back, and it's cancer, outside of my control. Get to the office. The boss says, can I, can I have a word with you? We're going to downsize, and you're not part of the vision. Perhaps it's from a loved one trying to cut ties, a child. Often problems are outside of our control. Here, these people, they tried to tame, tame the, these individuals. They had tried all these things, but nothing could solve the problem. Now, remember I told you that in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8 is a problem-solving chapter. Look at the Bible, if you would, please, and let's just glance through Matthew chapter 8 to see what Jesus has been dealing with this entire chapter. Beginning of the chapter, in verses 1 through 4, we find Jesus healing someone who has leprosy. Leprosy during this time was incurable. All right, it's incurable. Yet Jesus cured the incurable. And this leper came and Jesus healed him. In verses 5 through 13, we find out that Jesus healed someone who had palsy, or, or in essence, who was paralyzed. Even now, someone who is paralyzed has very little medical solutions in life. They may find some robotic uh, things to help them, but paralysis is very, very medically, very challenging. Jesus heals someone who the medical professional said, we can't help this. Verses 14 and 15, I find one of the most unique healings. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. What a blessing. 
Mom, if you're watching, if you were sick, I'd have Jesus heal you too. Now, some of you wouldn't have Jesus heal your mother-in-laws. Shame on you. Shame on you. But Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. After this, in verse, look at verse number 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Man, that was a great evening. Everyone who was sick, who came to Jesus, had their sickness healed. Man, wouldn't you just love that to happen today? Can you imagine the lines that would, would, that would fill out the door? Imagine if we announced at the First Baptist Church, listen, next Sunday morning, Jesus will be, be here and he will hear, heal everyone who is sick. Jesus was in the problem-solving business. Everyone who came, in fact, verse 17, it, it tells us that, that he did this because it, he was fulfilling prophecy from Isaiah. That he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. My friends, Jesus Christ came to earth, all right, to heal and to bear burdens. And the greatest burden we face is the burden of sin. Sin is a problem that we have no solution for. We can't be good enough. We can't be brave enough. We can't do enough good works or attend to the exact right church. Sin is a problem that only Jesus can fix. And Jesus came to earth to fix that problem. But he also came to fix a whole heap of other problems. And often in your life and my life, the problem is outside of our control. But if we're going to be honest before the Lord, all our problems should be outside of our control. Put them in the hands of Jesus. We see throughout this that he, that he walked or that he healed, healed the storm or fixed the storm in the next chapter. And then we came to the end of this chapter. My friends, there are problems in life. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know how big it may seem. I don't know how small it may seem. But I know this, that Jesus Christ can and wants to solve your problem. But I noticed something in this account, something that I need to be reminded of and something I think you need to be reminded of. Jesus, he, he cast out these demons. In fact, the Bible says, and twice this word is used, besought in these, in these verses. It means there was a, a request that was made. The first time it's used that the, the devils, the demons, asked Jesus a question, a favor per, per se, and he granted it. Later on, we'll see other people, the city, ask a favor as well. The demons asked to be cast into this great herd of pigs. In other passages, we find out that there was about 2,000 pigs. Now, I love the Bible. And uh, I love the understatements of the Bible, right? There's no number here. It just says a great herd, right? 2,000 is a great herd of pigs. If you're like, I got pigs, how many? 2,000. We're like, wow, that's a whole heap of pigs. That's a whole heap of pigs. In fact, if these pigs were worth 100 bucks, that'd be $200,000. That's a whole heap of pigs. <laughs> that's... Uh, that's a whole bunch. Of it. And so they go to the pigs, and the pigs, <laughs> the pigs jump off the cliff and die. Now, when we get to heaven, hopefully we can find out why Jesus sent them to pigs and why the pigs jumped off and died. Because there is not a clear answer in Scripture. People argue about this. I did a little deep dive study. When I study, I try to deep dive into these things. And I have not found, and maybe a scholar in here will say, listen, you know, maybe Dr. Flanders come back. Well, this is why Jesus had the pigs die. Uh, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. It seems completely random. But this is what Jesus did. Put them here, and the pigs died. All right? If you're like, well, pigs signify bacon, and bacon's not good for you. And Jesus was telling us, bacon, no, no, no. All right, don't read into that. Bacon's just fine. Moderation. It's not why. It wasn't about bacon, I promise you. Well, pigs were unclean to the Jews, and so Jesus was getting rid of unclean things. Nope, it's not why. Sorry. The bottom line is this. Not only are often our problems are outside of our control, but often Jesus solves problems differently than we imagine. And this is key in my life and your life. 
There are times that I want Jesus to solve a problem, but I will tell him how to solve it. Lord, I have this financial problem, and I'm going to work overtime. You will give me this much money on these particular days. It will work out perfectly. Thank you, Jesus, for solving my problem. Check the box. And I have clear plans for Jesus on how to solve a problem. But often the solution is different than I imagine. In fact, I was looking at all this sermon and thinking about how the Lord provided this house for the men's homes, for the ministry here. Many of you know, some of you may not, that back in October, November, a house burned down here where we house men who are in a program here. And, and we're praying, Lord, this is your problem. Solve it. And we thought he was going to solve it in one way. He solved it differently. Often the solution is different than we imagine. Often we say, Lord, why did you solve it that way? Now, understand, often we perceive it to be better than how we imagined. But sometimes, my friends, that's what happened right here. Sometimes we perceive God's solution to be worse than the problem. This is huge. Because in your life and my life, there's a problem. We're like, Lord, solve the problem. And he does solve it. But then we think, Lord, how you solved it was worse than the problem. You see, these two individuals were causing some panic, causing some fear, causing some problems for the residents of this town. But they still had a livelihood of 2,000 pigs to depend on. When Jesus solved the problem, there are no more pigs. What were they to do? They didn't sell the pigs. They didn't get good money for them. The pigs were gone. Their livelihood, roughly what they would have been worth, but two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, half a million in our economy. Who knows what would have been, but it was a great deal of money lost just to get rid of two individuals who are causing a panic right here. And what I see is that these people didn't appreciate the solution. My friends, in your life and my life, there are going to be times that God solves a problem. If we're not careful, we won't appreciate the solution. You can ask the question, why did God send the pigs? And my friends, as a pastor of First Baptist Church, with a Bible degree, I have no earthly idea. I do know this, that my Bible says that the Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts high above you. My friends, I don't know sometimes why God chooses to solve problems differently than I imagine. I don't know why sometimes that God, when the problem is solved, it appears, it appears that it is worse than the problem. But I do know of God's intense love for his children. I do know God's unfathomless, or fathomless love for the world at large. I do know that what God does is good. And I do know that nothing escapes God's plan, that God works all things after the counsel of his own will. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves, that God cares, that God is in control. I don't always know why the solution may look different, but sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Read about a novice truck driver driving down the road. Driving down a two-lane road. He looks up and he sees behind him six, six trucks. He comes over the hill. He sees four trucks ahead of him coming this direction and two are about to pass. He's got a buddy next to him. Ed, his co-driver's asleep. And he wakes up his, his co-driver, Ed. After this, they ask him, why would you wake up your co-driver? What else could you have done? He said, there's nothing I could have done, but I woke up Ed because he ain't never seen a wreck like this before. <laughs> Sometimes, solution I mentioned this a few times in church, but I remember a few years back when I had a particular problem that I was praying through. I was out walking one morning and praying. I said, God, I need you to solve this problem. A little bit angst and, and just some passion in my heart praying. And I remember clear as day where I was at over there on, William, on Williamson Road when God stopped me. 
And he said, what if I don't solve the problem? Is that okay? I remember in my spirit, J.D. Howell's spirit, thinking, no, Lord, that's not okay. I'm praying for you to solve this problem. I'm asking you to solve it. And almost clear as day, I am reminded of this verse, for my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul gives this response, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So what if God kills all the pigs? And so now we got to depend upon God every day, faith by faith, day by day with simple faith. Is it really a bad thing to have to trust in the power of God every single day? But Lord, that's not the solution I wanted. I wanted just this problem solved. I don't want to have to have faith in you every day. I want to do my own thing. My friends, sometimes the solution is different. Is different than we imagine. Then I notice just one of the saddest verses, I think, in the Bible. That's verse 34. Because verse 33, it says, And they that kept them, that's the, the pigs, fled and went back their ways in the city and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. In verse 34, And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they asked him something. They asked him a favor. They made a request of him. They requested that he would depart out of their coasts. What a sad verse. They were so consumed with the solution of the pigs that they ran. The whole city went, ran, got to Jesus. Said, Jesus, would you please, please leave? Jesus, we don't want you on these shores anymore. You can leave this coast. Go take your solutions. Go take your power. Go take it somewhere else. It's sad because if you remember back in verse 16, that one evening Jesus cast out demons and healed all that were sick. I have to ask myself, in that city, I wonder how many were sick. I wonder how many had leprosy. I wonder how many were paralyzed. I wonder how many mother-in-laws had a fever. I wonder how many were under oppression or possession. I wonder how many problems were in that city. And the city said, Jesus, we don't want you here any longer. You see, not only are our problems often bigger than we can control, and the solution is different than we imagine, remember that our reaction has a larger effect than we can perceive. I imagine when Jesus went away, they were happy. Got that troublemaker out of the way. Can you believe he destroyed our pigs, our livelihood, whatever we do now, not realizing that they had just dismissed the creator of the universe. I have to wonder, this is how my mind works, I apologize. What if they had came and asked for something else? What if they had came and said, Lord, thank you, but Lord, we need some livelihood. Could you get us some more pigs? He's a creator, is he not? Owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Could he have brought back 4,000 pigs? Would that have been too hard for Jesus? Help me here. What if he said, Lord, we'd like some cows too. Could he brought some, back some cows along, along the, the situation too? Lord, we'd like some, some fig trees. What could Jesus have done? He could have done anything. He just healed incurable diseases. He healed fevers and, and paralyzation he solved. He commanded the winds and the waves. There was nothing too hard. And in their, in their short-sightedness, in their fear and view of loss, they missed the power and the compassion of Jesus Christ. And instead of seeing hope and salvation, all they saw was fear and loss. And they said, Jesus, would you please leave? My friends, here's my admonition for us today. Let's be sure. Let's be real sure to invite Jesus, not push him away. 
Now, that may be in salvation. But also after we're saved, I'm reminded of this verse in Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And this verse was given to the church, those who know Jesus. And my friends, I'm afraid there are times that because of the way God has decided to solve a problem, we say, you know what, Jesus, that's it. You can stand right here. Can you imagine what they missed out on because they pushed Jesus here instead of saying, Jesus, come over here. In our homes, you know what we need? We need Jesus Christ involved. I want Jesus in the Howell households. First Baptist Church, I want Jesus Christ here. In your house, I want Jesus Christ. At your job, guess who needs to be there? Jesus Christ. In the midst of your problem, you know who you need? You need the one who can solve all the problems. You say, but I just don't like the way he's going to solve it. But my friends, I promise you, he'll solve it in a good way. It may not look good at first. It may be confusing. Just like when a parent solves a problem for a child. Right? Did children always understand it the first time? Do they say, oh, wise parents, God bless you. Thank you for nap time. This is wonderful. Thank you for this bubblegum medicine. I love it. Thank you for restricting my candy intake. I'm so thankful for wise and godly mothers and fathers. Is that what kids say? Sometimes begrudgingly, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. They don't always see it. But if they're around long enough, they see it, don't they? My friends, we're the children of God. You never know what God's going to do. Story upon story. I went to the hospital this past week. I see someone from our church there. You have to wonder sometimes why, why do people get sick? If I got to choose, I'd, well, that, none of you be sick. There's plenty of people in the world I can make sick as opposed to these people right here. Here at the hospital and visiting this individual in the bed next to him. I'm about to pray with him. In the bed next to him, the lady said, well, well, can you pray for me as well? Gave her a track, gave her the gospel. She got saved. Why was I there that day? Because so-and-so was sick? Or was it because also someone else needed salvation? You see, I want Jesus in, not out. In your life, don't push him out. Don't push him out. And Christians, you say, well, I'm saved. I'm not pushing him out. Jesus said to the Christians, I'm at the door knocking. Let me come in. Let me abide with you. Let me fellowship with you. And if you do, I will fellowship with you. So my question, what's your problem? Is it big? Is it medium? Is it small? I know this, that Jesus can solve it. And I know that he may not solve it just like you want him to. It may be different. But I know that how you respond to that will have large effects in your life. If you read the other accounts, you'd find out that this man, at least one of the men, who was healed that day, got the demons cast out, he wanted to go with Jesus. And he was begging to go with Jesus, and Jesus said, no, 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 you stay here. You stay here. You find out in the other accounts that he goes back to the town, and he tells people about Jesus. And many believe because of his testimony. And this just shows the compassion of Jesus Christ. They came and they said, Jesus, please go away. And you know what we would have done? Our temptation would be done? Fine. I'm out of here. I'm done with you. You don't get nothing from me, but not Jesus Christ. His compassion, he said, listen, you can still come to me. My friends, let him come in. Don't push him away.